dudes. Look at this freaking camera. I don't know why I went all Jack Black on you there, but seriously, look at this freaking camera. Look at it! It's insane. Uh, it looks like a Fuji GX617 had a baby with a beer keg. Like, what? It says, barely looks like a camera. This is a Noblex Pro 6150F. And uh, a viewer was kind enough to let me borrow this for the past couple months. And um, I gotta say, it's the weirdest freaking camera I've ever used, both in functionality and just overall design. It looks crazy. So uh, I have thoughts. You may be surprised to know. So I want to talk about the Noblex. I want to talk about swing lens panoramic cameras, how they compare to a uh, standard panoramic camera. And uh, I got some new pictures to share with you. So um, first off, uh, I'm actually one degree of separation away from the creator of this camera. This camera was developed by a uh, panoramic photographer by the name of Cornelia Schorle, uh, an East German fella. That's right, East Germany. He escaped East Germany. and. Um, my one degree of separation is he eventually lived in Orange County for quite some time and opened a uh, camera store by the name of Pro Photo Connection, which is my lab and uh, uh, printing house now. Uh, he's no longer affiliated, but he developed this camera. He approached a, a German by, with the last name Noble, I believe, and uh, developed the Noblex. And these come in both 120 and 35 millimeter formats. I believe uh, this is the 120 version obviously you can tell by its gigantic comically huge size um, but this has been a pretty fun camera to use now you may be aware of the wide lux or horizon variety of swing lens panoramic cameras uh, those are a little more popular partly because um, jeff bridges who was featured in this uh, article of silver grain classics autumn 2020 uh, uses a wide lux and uh, he's probably the most well-known uh, swing lens panoramic photographer uh, at least I'm aware of um, by the way this article did a great uh, review of swing lens panoramic cameras the different options available what some of their common uh, issues are uh, it's actually a good read so um, but the wide lux or horizon panoramic cameras are very different than the noblex in a key way so on a Noblex, when you take a picture, the lens swings across the plane, just like on a Wide Lux or Horizon camera. But the key difference is on the Noblex, it actually gives the lens time to speed up. So it actually starts the rotation, but doesn't start the exposure right away. It lets the barrel speed up to get to a constant speed, and it has that momentum to finish the exposure in one nice smooth motion. Um, a somewhat common occurrence with Wide Lux, and I think Horizon, is that the, sw the swing lens is gear driven and it, you know, when you click, as soon as it starts swinging, it starts exposing. And what can happen is it's not a completely smooth motion throughout the entire exposure. So you end up with banding, basically uneven exposure vertically across the frame as the lens kind of stutters or slows down as it goes across. So they require a fair amount of uh, maintenance and CLAs. Um, whereas the Noblex, it has that momentum right from the beginning. So it actually is a pretty, um, uh, you know, consistent mechanism in terms of exposure. So that's an interesting uh, design element of the Noblex. But what you may be more interested in is how this camera differs from the panoramic camera you've seen me use over and over again, which is my Shenhao TFC 617A. Um, so the Noblex is a swing lens panoramic camera. This is just a standard camera with a panoramic uh, frame. So I want to talk about the key differences between those and um, how that results in a different looking photo. But first, uh, before we talk about how the Noblex works, let's talk about how just the Shenhao works. And this would be the same on any sort of standard panoramic camera. So I'm talking like the Fuji G617, the Fuji GX617, or maybe the Hasselblad X-Pan. Those types of cameras, along with this type of camera, is a very straightforward concept, and they essentially work like any other camera, which is the lens projects a nice big image circle, and then the film crops a rectangle out of that. And that's really how any camera works, even a little 35 millimeter camera. The lens is projecting an image circle, and then the film is cutting a rectangle out of that. You know, if it's 35 millimeter, you're getting a rectangle with a ratio of two to three. Um, if you're on a medium format, 
a 6x6 camera like my Mamiya C220 for instance. Again, the lens is projecting a circular image and it's just cutting out a square from it. So a rectangle with a ratio of one, one to one. On my Shenhao, it's no different. Nice big image circle and then the film crops out a rectangle from the center of that image circle um, in a ratio of one to three, the way I crop them. So that's really how kind of any standard camera works. The swing lens panoramic camera works completely differently. So the film, first of all, is not flat. The film is actually held in a curve uh, in the back of the camera. So when you load up film, it's actually kind of this crazy interlocking maze of wheels to hold the film down on this curved plane. And then when you take a photo, of course, the lens swings. So it actually exposes the image kind of like a scanner. Uh, the image is actually being recorded as a slit across the frame. And so the image view is circular. The, fi the film plane is circular. It's very different than shooting like with a Shenhao or a, a Fuji or a Hasselblad X-Pan. Now, the big thing that that changes is with a swing lens panoramic camera, you get a cigaring effect on your subject. So cigar, fat in the middle, skinny on the outsides. Uh, and that's what happens with um, these swing lens panoramic cameras. The subject is big in the middle and kind of skinny on the outsides. And this is most noticeable, of course, when you have horizontal lines going through a frame. Um, to give you an, uh, an example of why it does this. Um, so imagine, you know, you're out photographing like a building. Uh, let's say you're on Route 66 photographing the garage uh, that I photographed quite a while back, and um, you got yourself a Noblex. Uh, and I got myself a Shenhao. And we're both gonna do a panoramic composition of this garage. Now on my Shenhao, um, I don't get any sort of weird linear distortion on the horizontal lines because again, I'm just taking a nice big image circle and cropping out the middle. So I'm not getting any weird effects. No different than if you're shooting a medium format camera pointed at it or a 35 millimeter camera pointed at it. But you with your Noblex, you go to take a picture and at the beginning of the exposure, the lens is actually gonna be looking down the road and then it's gonna swing, it's gonna be looking directly at the building and then it's gonna be looking down the road again. So as a result, you get a photo where the left side of the composition looks like you're looking down the road and down the building, and the right side of the composition looks like you're looking down the road and down the building, but the center looks like you're looking right at it. Whereas my composition looks like I'm just looking right at the building, edge to edge, corner to corner. And that's what creates the cigaring effect. It's essentially that perspective you get on the left and right where lines converge off into the distance. Now, that cigaring effect, um, is interesting, I suppose, but it can be a massive drawback and very frustrating at times. Because, you know, if you're doing architectural work, you don't really want lines to bend and you don't want roads to look like they're going off into the distance. But you can use it to a creative effect. You know, you can make some cool compositions where things are real big and distorted in the middle and skinny off to the left and right. It's a creative tool, but it's not suitable to every single subject, like any creative tool. Um, so that's the cigaring effect you get with these uh, uh, swing lens panoramic cameras. That's kind of issue number one. Now issue number two is if you want to minimize distortion, you have to keep this camera level front to back and side to side. Because again, imagine if it's going to be swinging across the frame and your camera is pointed up a little bit, what's going to happen is you're going to swing looking down at the ground on the left looking up at your subject in the middle and then down on the right uh, as the lens swings around. So you get this really super distorted horizon. Most noticeable, of course, when you have a clear horizon, like down at the beach, you can see in this shot here, I was pointed up ever so slightly. I actually thought I was level, but I was shooting handheld. That wasn't perfect. You can see the horizon develops this bow in it. It looks like a bowl. And that's because the swing lens look down on the left, down on the right, and up in the middle. So you end up with a horizon that's low in the middle and high on the right and left. Now, this um, distortion is not super noticeable if you don't have a clear horizon, but um, it's still gonna be there uh, even if the subject doesn't have a clear horizon. Uh, with my Shenhao, not only can I um, level the camera and then shift the lens up to 
get an upward perspective, but I can actually point this camera straight up and it's fine. It's not gonna get any more distortion than like a 35 millimeter camera would pointed up at a subject. You'll get the perspective distortion of things bending inward, but you're not gonna get that bowing you get on the horizon when you do a uh, swing lens panoramic camera. So that's one of the limitations. If you're, uh, unless you're willing to get some serious distortion, you really can't point the camera up or down. Just as an extreme example here, I wanted to see what would happen. Uh, on 4th of July, I just took this very sharply pointed up composition um, uh, at my house here. And you can see like the car on the right is practically riding the, the right edge of the frame. Uh, and the telephone poles are all bent in, the house on the left is bent in. Now, if I was doing that with my Shanhao, I would get a little bit of bending in, but it wouldn't be to this effect. And it wouldn't be that kind of curvature you get with the uh, swing lens panoramic. Um, so the Noblex definitely has some limitations compared to the Shenhao, but you know, it's kind of apples and oranges. Uh, there are some key differences that, um, you know, each has their pros and cons. Uh, first off, let me just explain the difference in film format. So my Shenhao is a six by 17. Uh, the Noblex is not that wide. Um, the negatives on the six by 17 measure, and I'm talking the actual image area about 54 millimeters high by 168 millimeters wide, whereas on the Noblex, it's about 50 millimeters high by 120 millimeters wide. So it's not as wide of a cropping. Uh, my Shenhao, I cropped to a one by three aspect ratio. The Noblex, I was cropping to a one by two and a half aspect ratio. But that means I get two more frames per roll. So the Noblex, I get six. The Shenhao, I get four. One interesting side effect of the lens being a swing lens is uh, the images have essentially no vignetting and no softness at the edges, which is very interesting because my Shenhao, even with a top quality lens or even with a center ND filter to help neutralize a vignette, there's still some degree of vignetting on pretty much every picture I take with the Shenhao. And that's purely because it's cropping such a wide view out of the image circle that it starts to get towards the edges of the image circle where you start to get light fall off and you start to get softness. So the Shenhao almost always has some degree of vignetting, even if I minimize it with a filter or a lens that has a particularly large image circle. But the Noblex, because the lens is swinging, it's only using the center of the lens. You really never use the edges of the image circle from this lens. So you get no light fall off. It's kind of interesting that the exposures have very even exposure left to right um, and you don't really get any softness at the edges like you would typically get on a wide view like this. The lens, by the way, on the Noblex is a 50 millimeter lens, um, which is very wide on a uh, medium format camera. Like on my RZ67, I have a 50 millimeter lens and it's super wide. It's probably equivalent to about 25 millimeters, 24 millimeters in 35 millimeter format. But we're taking a 50 millimeter and we're stretching it across a wider frame. So it's super freaking wide, man. To give you an idea of how wide the view is on this camera, notice how the camera has these little detents on the left and right side. That's for your fingers, because if your fingers are resting even a little bit outside those detents, they will show up in the photo. These bars here are the edge of the frame. So you can imagine you have an, an, a view that's just grazing across those bars. So your fingers can't be on the outside. They can't be lifted up a little bit on the inside. They have to be in those detents. It's crazy wide angle, man. So the images this, thing's cre this thing creates look super wide. It looks like using a 50 millimeter lens on my Shenhao, which I don't even have. The widest I have on my Shenhao is 72 millimeters, and that's crazy wide. Now, another weird thing with the lens swinging is uh, the flare looks pretty weird. Because, again, imagine it. You know, you got some sun coming at you right here. You're not going to get any flare over here because the lens is sunken into this barrel and it's not going to get any. But as you go towards this, you start to get a little more, and then you get a ton, and then you get no, none, and then by the end of it, it's, it's shaded from the sun again. So you get this kind of like banding of flare, uh, which is very odd, um, rather than kind of a natural looking flare that traverses the entire image. That's a pretty unlikely event to encounter flare if you're using this camera right though, so just kind of an interesting tidbit. Uh, filters on the Noblex are, I didn't use any because I don't have any that would work on this, but 
you essentially have to apply the filters to the lens with tweezers and they're magnetically connected. So with the camera, you have to move the barrel around uh, so that you can get to the lens. The way you do that, by the way, is you leave the camera off, you put it on multi-exposure, then you hold the shutter while rotating the barrel and that unlocks it so that you can swing it around and you'll see the lens in there. And there's a magnetic ring around it. So if you want to use filters or close-up lenses, you can put it in with tweezers very carefully and then um, close the barrel back up. Uh, so kind of a weird way to use filters. Definitely a pain in the ass compared to the Shenhao, which just has a nice filter thread on the front. Um, now shooting verticals with this swing lens panoramic is kind of interesting because again, you get that cigaring effect. So if you point up at a real tall subject, like a building or a tree, you're gonna get it big and fat in the middle, skinny at the bottom, skinny at the top. I did a few of those and I don't know, I find them amusing because it looks like every subject is mad dogging me. Like, what's up, fool? These look like they're like bending back and what you want, dog? And I don't do a lot of vertical panoramics, but if I was gonna do it with my Shenhao, it, it wouldn't have that weird distortion. I would have the distortion of pointing up so things would look like they're bending backwards maybe, but I'm not gonna get that barrel effect in the middle uh, where it's small at the bottom, small at the top, and fat in the middle. Um, another issue I ran into with the Noblex is there's a lot of scratching. So the film has to go through so many rollers and it's under so much pressure that there's just lots of places that it can scratch. This is a well-serviced Noblex. The guy who let me borrow it got it serviced recently but still scratching. Um, you see that on a lot of the pictures that I took, so that's unfortunate. But now controlling the camera itself, um, in terms of aperture, shutter speed, and all that. So the aperture and the focus are both controlled on the front barrel using these little wheels. And by the way, not every Noblex allows you to adjust focus. Uh, some are fixed focus on like infinity. But one barrel lets me adjust the aperture, another barrel lets me adjust the focus, and the focus is just at three options, infinity, five, and one. And I believe that's meters. So one meter, five meter, and infinity. Uh, really three positions. Um, I found focusing this thing to be an absolute nightmare. I just, it's so unintuitive for me to think of turning the camera around, adjusting a wheel, to set the focus and then go back. I'm just not used to it. I'm used to SLRs and view cameras where I have a knob and I can kind of see from the back of the camera that I'm out of focus. Um, this was frustrating. Perfect example, there's a, uh, a cat in the neighborhood here that I was trying to get a picture of on, on this thing, just a neighborhood cat and I was walking around with this kind of like a street camera and uh, I kept wanting to get a picture of it. but. I was always late to adjust the focus. So like the first one, I accidentally had it set on five or infinity and the cat got too close and it was too late for me to switch to one. And then by the time I got it switched to one, it was bored of me and it walked off. Uh, another day I came back, I had it set to one, I was all ready to go, but then it still got too close to me. So it, it's kind of frustrating having to adjust focus by turning it around and fiddling with this kind of awkward wheel, but you know, that's the way it's done. Um, so aperture and focus both on the front there. Shutter speed, pretty straightforward. You have uh, five available shutter speeds here. You have one two fiftieth, pretty fast. You have one one twenty fifth. You have one sixtieth. You have one thirtieth. And then you have one fifteenth. And you can tell each one of those shutter speeds takes a lot longer than the shutter speed indicates. Like that was a lot longer than 1 15th of a second to complete that exposure. And that's for two reasons. First of all, the barrel has to wind up. Remember, it's gotta get that momentum to get an even exposure. So there's a delay anyway, from when you click to when you expose. But also it's exposing 1 15th of a second on each vertical slit of the image. So to traverse the entire frame takes more than 1 15th of a second. Now, you also have multi-exposure uh, on this camera. You just have a little switch that you switch to M. And not only does that allow you to do multi-exposures, but it makes it possible for you to put the shutter speed longer than 1 15th. So here's how it works. Let's say you wanted to do a shutter speed of one full second. We don't have one full second on here, so how do we do it? Basically, you do 15 exposures at 1 15th of a second using the multi-exposure function. So 
I would set up my camera. I'd probably use a cable release, that would be smart. And then I would put it on multi, and then just click and hold. And I would let this thing rotate 15 times. And the way the camera works is as long as you keep holding, it keeps rotating. So one full second is gonna take way longer than one full second because it's gotta do 15 rotations of a shutter speed that's already going slower than 1 15th. So I didn't do a lot of long exposure stuff with this, but I did go down to the beach at sunset to see how the waves would react to a long shutter speed like that. And I needed to do a shutter speed of 1 4th of a second. So what I had to do was take 1 15th and do four exposures. Um, I know the math doesn't work out perfectly. It would technically need to be 1 16th of a second with four exposures gets you to 1 4th, but numbers are close enough. So to get my 1 quarter of a second, I needed four rotations. So I put it on multi exposure, 1 15th, and clicked uh, four times to get my exposure. And so what ends up happening is you don't get a traditional looking long exposure. Uh, the water doesn't get that foggy look like you would on a normal camera at one fourth of a second. Instead, you get four exposures overlapping each at one fifteenth of a second. So in this picture here, you can see very clearly there are four edges to the waves. And those are the four different exposures, the waves coming in each time and me exposing, and then they overlap. Not only that, you can see that this woman here moved for each exposure. So I have four uh, copies of this woman ghosted in the, in the image. So if you're looking to get kind of traditional long exposures, you know, cars with the, the trail streak, the waterfall with the water uh, all softened up, ocean water all fogged out, it's not gonna look the same on this camera uh, because you're not technically doing one long exposure, you're doing a bunch of faster exposures all overlapped. Now, if you overlapped enough of them, they would probably eventually smooth out to look pretty similar to a regular camera to long exposure, but it doesn't really look identically the same. You end up with a lot of ghost image of uh, things that moved, you know, sailboats that moved between the uh, one exposure to the next, uh, waves overlapping, you get that kind of ghost image of the waves overlapping. Um, it's a very interesting way to go about long exposures. Now, loading the film, um, there's definitely a, a way to screw this up. And in fact, um, in all the rolls I did, I only screwed up one of them. Uh, and so what happened is the frames ended up overlapping and I lost a frame or two. Um, this thing's a little finicky on loading up film. But essentially, you put the roll on the left uh, and the take up spool is on the right. You bring it over to the take up spool and start winding it up until the arrow on your 120 film lines up with the red dot. Um, one of the guys at Pro Photo who's been working on these cameras for years told me to go a little bit past the red dot, so I did that. But this is the key. When you go to close the back of the camera, these two rollers are gonna push down the film pretty hard and that's to get it pushed against that curved back. There's a possibility that that's gonna pull the film off the take up spool. So what you have to do is hold the take up spool, like put some tension on it so that when you push these rollers down, it's gonna pull it from the unexposed film. It's gonna pull it out from that side. And that way you don't uh, take the film off the take up spool and you don't pull it back off the take up spool a little bit, screwing up the, the placement of the frames. And then when you close the back, you have to click the shutter, very important. If you don't click the shutter, you're gonna end up losing an exposure when you uh, turn the dial over to frame number one. Um, clicking it is not going to trigger the lens, it's just to release the mechanism in there so that you can move to the next exposure without the shutter uh, already being uh, cocked. So um, keep intention on the, on the film and making sure to click the uh, shutter release before you move to the first frame. Uh, very important when loading the film. Now that's kind of all the technical aspects of it. Let's talk about the actual usability. Um, so this camera is a super wide angle camera. It's a 50 millimeter lens, which is already wide angle. It's panoramic, which makes things look wider. And then it's 50 millimeter swinging across the panoramic. So it's just massively wide. Now, I generally don't prefer wide angle views these days. They're a little too dramatic in your face, epic kind of compositions. And I tend to be more interested in stuff that's a little more natural looking. So with longer focal lengths. 
So if you are going to use this camera, you have to treat it like a wide angle camera because that's what it is. And wide angle compositions generally do best when there is a uh, very interesting foreground element because the foreground element is going to become really pronounced on wide angle. And that's not just panoramics, that's any camera. So I tried to stick to compositions where the foreground is going to be interesting, you know, uh, trails going off into the distance, something interesting to, to carry that wide view. Um, I didn't get a ton of masterpieces because I was really just, uh, you know, testing out the camera. A ton of masterpieces. I didn't get any masterpieces. What am I, what am I saying here? So um, wide angle is not really my bag these days. Um, and I was mostly just testing the camera. But that wide angle view can work for some interesting compositions. I got a few architectural shots that I felt looked really cool. They were actually kind of interesting. The, the picture is full with a lot of subject matter. It's getting this super wide view, which is always kind of epic and interesting. But because it's wide angle, you really have to be um, selective with your compositions. And, uh, you know, I actually really wanted this camera as like a street camera. Now, I know I'm no street photographer. That's not my bag. I'm more of an architectural and landscape guy. But I always fantasize about being a street photographer. Uh, I think it would be so cool to be good at that. Um, I'm just not. And if I were to be a street photographer, It'd be so cool to shoot panoramics. So I was thinking like, yeah, this is a really cool street camera because you can shoot handheld, it's totally possible. It's got a viewfinder um, instead of, you know, viewing ground glass, which is much better for street photography. So I kind of treated it like a street photography camera. And I was taking pictures of like, you know, I had my parents over for 4th of July weekend. And so I took pictures of them playing cornhole or sack toss, whatever disgusting name you want to call it, um, taking pictures of my dog playing in the backyard. It was like, it was really fun for that type of stuff. So for me, this was really like a handheld street photography type camera, which I know sounds insane for something like this, but it was fun to use it in that sense. The only downside being is that it's so wide angle and it gets so damn close to everything. So it's kind of hard sometimes, especially when you factor in focus. Um, I shot a lot of black and white on this because I don't know, probably because of, uh, Jeff Bridges pictures. When I think of swing lens panoramics, I think black and white. So um, I kind of stuck to that. Um, so overall, it's a pretty cool camera. Um, I don't think I would ever buy one. It's uh, unless I was filthy rich and I could just have any camera I wanted to use once a year. But um, you know, after using it for a bit, I think not having the distortion of the uh, swing lens is uh, more in line with my style of photography. So, you know, as fun as this camera was, I think I'll be sticking with my Shenhao. All right, there you go. Noblex Pro 6150F. Um, if you enjoyed this, you want to help a brother out, you can go to nickcarverphoto.com slash contribute if you want to send me a few bucks. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys next time.